Almost every time you make a measurement, the result will not be an exact number, but it will be a range of possible values. The range of value, values associated with the measurement is described by the uncertainty or the error. So a quick exception to this is if you're counting a small number of objects. For example, here are three apples. There's no error associated with the number three there. You just say three. However, if you're counting a larger number of apples, like the number of apples in the back of this truck, we might say, well, there's 1,600, but there's probably an error associated with that. And a better way to write it would be to say there are 1,600 plus or minus 100 apples in the back of this truck. 1,600 is the value, and 100 is what's called the error. Also, some people call this the uncertainty. Errors eliminate the need to report measurements with vague terms like about or approximately. Errors give a quantitative way of stating your confidence level in your measurement. Saying that your answer is 10 plus or minus 2 means that you are 68% confident that the actual number is somewhere between 8 and 12. It also implies that you're 95% confident that the actual number is somewhere between 6 and 14. This is plus or minus twice the error, so it's called the 2 sigma range. To give you a, a better idea of what we're talking about, here's a histogram of a whole bunch of measurements of the same thing. And each time we measure it, we get a slightly different answer. But after making you know, maybe many hundreds of measurements, we plot the number of times we measured each, uh, each value with uh, the value itself. And here we see that about 68% of the time, or 68% of the total number of measurements, uh, they lie within plus or minus sigma of the middle. Uh, and about 95% of the measurements lie within plus or minus two sigma, or two errors, of the middle of the distribution. A probability distribution is a curve which describes what the probability is for various measurements. And the most important one that we will use in, in this course, and gets used a lot, is called the normal distribution. This was uh, first written down by uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss in the early 1800s, and so sometimes it's called the Gaussian, and a lot of people call it the bell curve. This is all the same thing. Here's an example of a whole bunch of measurements, a histogram, and this curve, or, or Gaussian, is uh, meant to be a, a fit to this histogram. So the equation for the Gaussian is A times e to the power of all this stuff, where this stuff is negative x minus x bar squared divided by 2 sigma squared. Here's what that curve looks like. Uh, A is the maximum amplitude of the curve. x bar is the mean, or average. And sigma is the standard deviation. Statisticians also uh, sometimes talk about the variance, which is sigma squared. We don't use that in this course too much, though. Sigma is a measure of the width of the curve. Larger sigma means a wider curve. And 68% of the area under the curve of a Gaussian lies somewhere between the mean minus the standard deviation and plus the standard deviation. And 95% of the area under the curve is uh, between the mean minus twice the standard deviation and the mean plus twice the standard deviation. So how do we actually use a Gaussian? Well, let's say we make a bunch of measurements, n measurements, of the same quantity x. And we don't get the same number each time we measure it. We get some distribution which we assume to be normally distributed. Uh, to keep track of things, I'll label each measurement of x with a subscript i. And I don't know what the mean is, but I can estimate the mean. And the way to estimate the mean is to sum up all your measurements and divide by the number of measurements. So here is the equation. We've used the capital letter sigma to sum from i equals 1 to n of all the values of x sub i, and then we divide by n. We can also estimate the standard deviation 
of this same sample. The best estimate of standard deviation is the square root of 1 over n minus 1 times the sum of the differences between your measurement and the mean all squared. Or, okay, and this dividing by 1 over n minus 1 is divided by the number of degrees of freedom. And in this particular calculation, we uh, have the number of measurements n, but we minus 1 because we used the estimate of the standard deviation, which came from these measurements, in our calculation. So we divide by 1 less than, than n. So there is roughly a 68% chance that any measurement of a sample taken at random will be within one standard deviation of the mean. Usually it's the mean is what we wish to know, and each individual measurement almost certainly differs from the true value of the mean by some error. So there's a 68% chance that any single measurement lies within one standard deviation of this true value of the mean. So it's reasonable to say that delta x sub i, or the error in each in, in a particular measurement x sub i, is equal to sigma. This error is often called statistical. Reading error. There's two types of reading error. Uh, ones that you get from analog instruments, such as like a ruler or something with a, with a needle on a dial. And there's digital reading error, uh, like you'd get from like a, something with a digital display on it. So let's start with analog. Imagine, let's say you use a ruler to measure the length of a pencil. And you line up the tip of the eraser uh, with the zero on the ruler, and here's the tip of, we're just zooming in on the tip of the pencil, which is somewhere near about eight centimeters. So actually this pencil looks to be about 8.25 centimeters long, but what's the error in that measurement? It turns out that for analog instruments, there's no fixed rule that will allow us to answer this question. You have to use your intuition and your common sense. And so my reasoning goes something like this. Could this pencil be as long as 8.3? Well, no. It, it looks like it's definitely shorter than 8.3. So my maximum I would be willing to go to might be about, I don't know, 8.28 or something. And what's the minimum? Well, it could be less than 8.25, maybe down to 8.23, but I don't think probably shorter than that. So I have some range, uh, 8.23 to 8.28. And a reasonable estimate of the reading error is half the range where you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So half of that range, uh, you subtract this, divide by 2, you get point. Uh, 0 0.025 centimeters. Let's just be cautious and round it up to 0 0.03. So we would say the length of the pencil is 8.25, my original estimate, plus or minus 0 0.03. Meaning that if we were to somehow get a whole collection of uh, objective observers, not me, but lots of people with rulers, and they all went out to measure this pencil, we would expect that most of them would have a value somewhere between 8.25 minus 0.3, so 8.22, and 8.25 plus uh, 0.03. Now for a digital instrument, usually it says uh, somewhere in the manual that the reading error is plus or minus one half the last digit. And what that means is that the last digit is some power of 10, and uh, one half of you know one in that last power of 10 is, is your error. So if it says 12.8, the last power of 10 is 0.1, right? So uh, half of that is 0.05. So we would write this temperature as 12.8 plus or minus 0.05 degrees Celsius. And it's good to put another zero there on your 12.8 on your just to make the last uh, tenth place in your number match with the last tenth place in your error. Now, what if we have both a statistical error, like a standard deviation, and a reading error? Well, usually one of these is much larger than the other. And so in that case, you just choose the larger one. For example, 
if every time you measure something, you always get the same numerical answer, like with that digital thermometer, it's 12.8, you dip it back in, 12.8, 12.8, this indicates that your reading error is dominant, okay? You're not getting any scatter. However, if you measure the same thing again and again, you keep getting wildly different answers that are outside what you would think to be your reading error, that means that your statistical error dominates, and so you use the standard deviation in that case. Okay, so now we come to our section of the error analysis document on significant figures. Now you'll find that this is much different than the section on significant figures in Knight. And that is because Knight and every other physics textbook I've come across uh, doesn't really discuss errors. And so this is a discussion of significant figures uh, as it pertains to numbers that have errors. The rules are a little different. So let's start with an example. Let's say we have a set of 30 timing measurements and uh, it's clear that the statistical error is dominant. So every time we measure the thing, we get a, a different answer, plus or minus about 0.1 seconds. So we use those 30 measurements that we, what we get and we have that equation for standard deviation. We plug it all into Excel or something like that, use the equation and we get 0.10293397 seconds is the computed estimate for the standard deviation. So let's consider one of those measurements, maybe the fifth time we measured the time we got uh, 5.49 seconds. The error, uh, since this is uh, a statistical error, we use the standard deviation. So we'd write 5.49 plus or minus 0 0.10293371. What does that mean? Well, it means that every time we measure it, there's about a 68% chance that the true value is somewhere between 5.49 minus this value and 5.49 plus this value. Is this right? Is this a good way to write this? No! Okay. Clearly, we're using way too many significant figures here if we're just trying to describe an estimate of the range of what we would measure. Okay, It's just as instructive and actually a little better to say that the number is, you know, somewhere between 5.49 minus 0.1 and 5.49 plus 0.1, so somewhere between about 5.4 and 5.6. Or you could just say the measurement is 5.5 plus or minus 0.1. That's the best way to write it. It's not just more concise than writing this thing above, it's more honest. So hopefully that motivated these following two rules. One, errors should only be specified to one significant figure, or you could maybe use two. In fact, a lot of scientific papers, they use two, but you never see anyone specifying an error to three or four significant figures. It's just way, way too much. Rule number two is that once you know uh, how many significant figures are in the, in the error, the most precise column in the number for the error should also be the most precise column in the number for the value. So if you specify the error to the 100th column, then the quantity itself, the value, should also be specified to the 100th column. Propagation of errors of precision. So if you have two or more quantities for which you know the errors, you might want to combine them somehow and compute a derived number. So you can use the rules for error propagation to infer the error of the derived quantity. So usually uh, for these rules, we say that we have x and y, and the errors are delta x and delta y in those two measurements. And these measurements and their errors must be independent of each other. So you can't have the error or you know, the measurement of y somehow depending on the measurement of x. They're just two measurements of separate things. Also, we're going to assume that uh, if you have the fractional error for something that can't be negative, um, delta, delta x divided by x, that this is much, much less than 1. So that being said, if you have, uh, let's say, a number z, which is the sum of x plus y, and you know the different or the error in x and the error in y, or this, the difference, in either case, you can find the error in z as being the square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared. So you add the errors of the 
two numbers you're adding or subtracting in, in quadrature, as it's called. Rule number two, the product or division rule, if you have uh, z is equal to x times y, or z equals x divided by y, then the error in z divided by z, so the fractional error in z, is equal to the square root of the fractional error in x squared plus the fractional error in y squared. Uh, rule, I'm calling it 2.1, the multiply by exact constant rule. Uh, if you've got z equals xy or z equals x divided by y and x here is an exact number, so there's uh, zero error in x, then uh, it follows from before that delta z is just equal to x times delta y or the absolute value of x times uh, delta y. And then there's an exponent rule. If you have z is x to the power n, where you know the error in x, then the fractional error of z is equal to the fractional error of x times n. And lastly, I just want to talk about the error in the mean. Let's say we repeat uh, measurements of the same quantity n times. So each individual measurement has an error delta x where delta x can be um, equated as the or computed as the standard deviation. Uh, we can use the rules of error propagation to show that the error in the mean is delta x divided by the square root of n. So if n is large then the error in the mean is less than the error of any individual measurement. And in fact this is why we take multiple measurements of the same thing is because we want to reduce our error. If we measure something once, uh, we'll get some error delta x. If we measure it uh, 100 times and take the mean, then we can reduce our error by a factor of 10.